Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Well, tonight, uh, basically, it's a work session. We do not have any items on tomorrow night's agenda of any old business or new business. Uh, tonight's discussion is for the next agenda. Uh, remembering that the meeting after tomorrow night will be on the 17th because of elections that will be held on the 15th. So the city council will meet again on the 17th. Uh, tonight, basically, uh, if you read the notice, we're going to try. We've got three CDA interviews tonight. We also have on the list a discussion of a potential for the property tax uh, referendum only. We're not, this city council, cannot pass a property tax. All they can do is potentially come up with a rate and put that out to a referendum for the public to vote on. And we're trying to get that process started now because of all the work that James has to do in the interim in order to get it out. We will also be discussing the question that's come up several times about mosquito spray or mosquito abatement. And the last thing, uh, if we have time, I think, uh, Councilor Wilson had one uh, item that he had brought up, but he was going to follow up with the Chief, so if we can get an update on that. Uh, if not, we'll make sure that the Chief's father had a heart attack, so he's not here tonight, but hopefully we'll be here tomorrow night. So again, we'll start off, and if you don't mind, uh, have y'all got your resumes? Everybody received resumes on all the candidates, and our first candidate is sitting there. If she doesn't mind coming forward, do we need the mic out? Or Cindy, I think we could hear you. I'll speak up. Now, you're welcome to take any format you want in presentation. Uh, you've been here before. You have a very impressive, very thorough resume. Just talk a little bit about yourself and why you want to be involved with the CDA. Uh, now, for those that are in the, in the audience, we did receive a recommendation from the current president of the CDA when Cindy put her name in the hat the last time. And he listed a whole plethora of things. Is why she was a very qualified candidate for the position. So that was sent back out to everybody on the council to make sure they kept that in consideration when they were looking at everything. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve, for the opportunity to come before the council to express my interest in serving on the CDA. Uh, you have copies of my resume, and I've listed my previous experience and my current experience. I've been living in Irondale now for a little over 10 years now. Moved here in 2006 from Texas. Uh, was born and raised in Texas and uh, received many wonderful uh, opportunities to meet wonderful people uh, in Victoria, Texas, which is where I was born and raised and grew up. And uh, as you, my resume reflects, I pursued a degree in business from the University of Houston. And uh, during that time, uh, I was privileged to have been hired to work for Victoria Bank and Trust and uh, went through their management training program for a year. Uh, this is where we go through the various departments in the banking, uh, the bank, and uh, we get to have hands-on experience and talk with the people that worked in the various departments. And after that training program concludes, we then go before the executive branch of the government, of, of the uh, banking industry, and we let them know uh, which area we really feel that we could contribute and we're really interested in, in uh, working in. And when I completed that program, I expressed, expressed an interest in the uh, marketing department and uh, was actually placed in the marketing department and got a lot of experience in marketing and working with the various uh, departments in the bank uh, had a lot of experience in working with them and planning their promotions. Uh, there were several departments that uh, would uh, go out to various uh, exhibit shows and so on to get with people throughout the uh, Victoria County area, whether it was farming and ranching or petrochemicals, because we had various petrochemical plants that were there, or whether it was with the Victoria Economic Development Corporation, because we had private bankers, commercial bankers, that were interesting, interested in the uh, various businesses that they were bringing in and providing them with banking services. And so we got a chance to get with 
several chemical plants, several large retailers in Victoria to talk about providing services for them and their employees. So that was a wonderful experience. I also got to learn about advertising, uh, meeting with our advertising uh, uh, firm that we hired. They were based out of San Antonio, planned our advertising campaigns, whether it was direct mail, newspaper, outdoor, outdoor uh, advertising, radio, television. It's great, great experience to work with them and learn about ways to promote our institution. Um, from there, I went on to work with the uh, credit aspect. They wanted me to, to look at potential to serve as a consumer lender. Uh, also, learn about mortgage lending and commercial lending. And the way that you do that is you go in and you take, take the uh, learning that you, that you have in this case, mine was business administration with a centralization in finance, uh, and do types of credit analysis where we take a look at the financial statements of either commercial, business, um, or mortgage, or um, consumer, analyze these financial statements. We had floor plan, plans for various dealers, automobile dealerships where we financed their entire inventory fleet that they had on the uh, actual property. Uh, we'd also do spot audits where we'd go in and just pick out 50 to 100 cars and make sure that they were on the floor plans uh, to make sure that that business was a uh, legitimate business and they weren't, you know, saying that they had this and we're financing it and it's not there. So we did these spot checks, I learned a lot. Did the same thing with commercial properties because some of these properties we held as collateral and so we had to make sure that everything was in order from insurance to property taxes that they paid, uh, everything to make sure that the properties were up to code uh, because God forbid if they should go under well, we had to make sure that these properties were going to pay off for the bank and we wouldn't suffer a loss because something wasn't up to code and the building wasn't safe and so on. So I got gained a wonderful experience there. And uh, from there, um, I learned about investments. Um, they wanted me to also learn about investments. So I went ahead and took the uh, Series 6, 63, and 7 exams and passed those, thanks be to God, um, and uh, also learned about how we could help our customers with their investments, uh, retirement monies, and so on. Um, I also, we had a subsidiary, Central Computers, that uh, was partnering, they did our data processing, and there was a guy in data processing that really was impressed with my work ethic and my always working hard, uh, taking any position I held seriously and earning that eight hours or 10 hours that I would put in. And so he wanted me on that end of the bank, a computer, uh, Central Computers, to serve as a tech writer analyst because I had a lot of analytical skills. And so he offered me a position there and because I wanted to learn about the data processing, because when I was in marketing or any other department, we'd meet with these guys and they'd always tell us, well, what you're wanting really isn't feasible. And so I was wanting to learn how can we make it feasible? Because these are needs, these are things that people, customers are talking about. How can we make this feasible to where we can offer them uh, this product? We had people that were interested in having a debit credit card on one card and wanted them to, they wanted to have the option of using it as a debit card or a credit card. And back then that was kind of coming into the market but not quite there. And so I was wanting to go on that end to, to see what we could do to make this a reality and something that would solve a need. And so as a tech writer, I uh, would meet with various uh, 
departments in the central computer organization, analysts and programmers, and uh, ask them questions, especially on new system upgrades, to learn about the system, get trained on the system, so that I could write the documentation for training purposes. And so I did that for a couple of years and would go throughout, because we own 35 other banks in the state of Texas, and so actually travel there and give that, put on these training sessions for their employees because we were going to be upgrading our systems and we wanted them to, to be very comfortable with what we were doing so that they could service the customers in these communities that they served. And so I really took pride in doing that and working with them and answering their questions and getting answers to questions that I didn't perhaps have an answer to and getting back with them right away. So I uh, enjoyed learning about this environment of data processing. During this time, excuse me, excuse yes. me. Hey, well, when we get some opportunity to ask some questions, I, you can, I'm, yeah. I'm satisfied that she's, you know, You're, you've seen her resume. I've seen her resume, and, okay. and I've got questions that I'd like to ask of her. It's so you you all right with the CGA. Questions, I think that's fair. Question all right. All right. Uh, several years ago, the city. Uh, supplied the CBA with money to purchase a building in the city and the uh, the city was receiving the rent on this building that amounts to uh, what I understand $17,000 a month that's two, a little over $200,000 a year four years ago the CBA took actions to divert that rent from the from the city to the CDA's account um, now CDA is receiving that uh, $200,000 a month, I mean a year, and which I believe should be coming to the city and not to the CDA. If you're appointed for the CDA, will you work to have this rent payment turned back over to the city's uh, general fund, or do you believe the CDA should continue to receive this, this uh, rent money? I want to know more about the specifics that was involved in that, Terry. Uh, as to why did the CDA feel that they were justified in having those funds, that rental money, monthly money, turned over to the CDA. I really want to reach a workable solution because I think it's important uh, because just the, the time that I've been here, I feel that there's a, I not only feel, but I've seen things where there isn't communication, an effective communication, and it has cost the city significant amount of money, whether it be a, a, an agreement that was made with, say, for instance, Sonic, yeah. uh, where the city winds up having to pay money to Sonic. Um, and I just think that if we had more effective communication between both the city, the mayor, the city council, and the CDA, I think that we could reach much more positive results uh, and give the city its due as well as the CDA and what they're planning to do with these, you know, these properties that they're receiving mm -hmm. funding. Well, what are you planning C to do with this? Well, the, the CDA over the last four years since they took over the monthly rent payment mm -hmm. has received approximately, I estimate, a little over $800,000. And what I understand is the CDA currently has uh, $250,000 in the bank. Now, we know uh, almost $100,000 of that 800, we know where it went. Uh, it it uh, was stolen from the city, but what happened to the other $450,000? I'd like a, an accounting for that to the, to the citizens, because this is not CDA's money. This is uh, money that belongs to the citizens of the city of Irondale. One of the things that I would suggest, uh, these is issues that are coming up, to suggest that there be an audit conducted to get answers to these questions that you have and others may have. I well, think that's important. Well, I feel like the CDA should be responsible to the city, citizens of the city as well as, and, uh, and, 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 and these books should be open so everybody can see them and we know what's, what's happening to that $200,000 every year. I think it's important that um, if I am 
fortunate to be appointed to the board, to the CDA, I would want to be able to give you these answers. And that would mean taking a look at these things and getting you the answers because I think we both need to work together so that we can move Irondale forward and we can do things that are important to this community. And one of the things that's important is to not only rent these properties, but provide the city with a tax base. You know, the city can operate by having an increase in tax revenue, and that's important as well. So I think it's important that, and I certainly will play a role in opening these doors so that we can communicate. There needs to be much more communication and much more transparency. And just for a uh, point of conversation tonight, for those in the audience, remember once the CDA is reconstituted by the city, the city has no control over the CDA. It, by state statute, it is a self-feeding, self-enclosed entity. The only way it can be changed or altered is by its own membership. So uh, we went through a series of issues with a prior CDA, that shut itself down. The mayor chose at one point to reconstitute the CDA. We've had some issues since that's been reconstituted, but at this point it is a vibrant, self-feeding entity unless it chooses to shut itself down. Do know that there have been interviews with auditors. The debate now will be which auditor to pick, the last interview is tomorrow, and the size of the audit. Uh, I attend the CDA meetings only as a liaison, so I am not a voting member. But basically the idea is whether we're looking at a full-blown audit that looks at both operational parameters as related to state statute and the financial side, or do some hybrid in between. The prices on that range up to about $12,000 at this point. Probably worth every penny since we had the issue with the money that was taken out of the CDA funds inappropriately during the past two years, three years. So again, all of this is in play. The question becomes now, the control that you have as a council member over the CEA is who you appoint to that council member and who you think is going to do the best job of managing the money that actually belongs to the citizens of Ironville. So what you want is somebody that's going to be open, but know that any citizen can request to see the books. Mr. Stewart keeps the books. They are public information because it is public funds. If anybody would like to look at it, I have one of the latest financials right here. From the CDA? Yes. That, yeah, I'd like to see it. Yes, yeah, that's what I was about to. That's I'm good. sorry, can I? Yeah, pass it on. Go ahead. Um, I was about to express any of the financials are always available uh, when the CDA either has a meeting or we can request uh, any kind of financials from the CDA, I mean, all that is public records. So that has never been an issue. Is that right? But uh, Cindy, from your perspective, I think the basic question, uh, we got a, uh, the, the CDA actually voted in one of their meetings to turn the remaining funds over to the city at the end of the year. That's never happened since they voted to do that over, I think maybe three years ago. So those funds have been main, maintained within the CDA. So there's little things like that. And if you look at financials, uh, there are some areas that you might question amount of money spent on food, amount of money spent on training. What is the citizens of Irondale getting back for the money that was spent? And when we're trying to attract business, you've got to remember, we need revenue that comes from a business that does revenue in the city. We have a lot of big vendors in the city, huge, international. But you've got to remember, the revenue goes to the point of sale. So what we get is licensing fees, and if they happen to do a job within our city limits. That's true with anything like a furniture store, anything that delivers outside of our limits or does business outside of our limits. So uh, we've got great industry. We just don't have large revenue in turn of producing. I guess Southern Salvage is one of our larger ones. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Southeast. and then we have uh, Southeast and Salvage, mm -hmm. and then we had the one that just closed. So, the, you know, those are the type things, uh, Sam's, right. those type businesses are what we need. Right, and that's one of the things I was saying. Yes, understanding that both are autonomous, in a sense, if you will. Um, it's important that the communication 
be taking place both from input from the mayor, the city council, the citizens of Irondale, and the CDA so that we can prioritize what do we want in Irondale and how will this benefit Irondale from a tax revenue and so on. These things need to be prioritized so that we don't wind up with what you just stated, the example you said, because it doesn't fully benefit the community. And it's important that we communicate and we prioritize what is going to do this, which industry is going to achieve these things that we have in common, these goals that we have in common. So I think that'd be the first thing, is to come up with a priority list so that we're all on the same page and we're all trying to work towards this goal. Uh, for the sake of time, in case our next candidate does show up on time, we're going to take a few minutes of his time because Mr. Stewart has conflict and we want to get one item in while he's still here. But are there any, you've seen the resume. You have to admit, strong background. Uh, one thing I kind of liked on there was the bilingual. That may come in handy because we've got a strong community in this area. And there is the ability to potentially attract business from that sector. So uh, again, any specific questions for Cindy? I know, uh, you know, we've had her up before us before. We know her passion's there. She's becoming more involved with different things around the city to try to get back to the city. I think this was just one more step, but again, questions like you've had, Terry. Why do you want to be a part of the city? Why, Why do I want to be the best part? candidate? Why do you think you're the best candidate to uh, be a part of the city? Well, I have skills in various, whether it's financial, the fact that I am bilingual, and the fact that I can work with all people, all types of diverse backgrounds and so on, I think is a strength and I think it will benefit Irondale because the CDA, they're out there trying to lure in business and you've got to have people that are competent that can speak their language. And so that's why I feel I'm, I'm best qualified to fill this position. Mr. Spidey, anything you take it? Councilor Billy. Councilor Wilson, any more questions? Cindy, do you have any more specific comments? I'm not trying to rush you. No, no. Um, but uh, if there's any, does anyone in the audience have any questions they might like to pose? I would want to did Go want ahead, to say please. one thing, uh, Steve, and that is, you know, I appreciate you letting me know about these things, Terry. Uh, I wasn't aware of much of what you're saying here. Mm -hmm. I concur with your wanting answers. I think that's important. So I just want you to know that. If you have any questions for me, if I'm appointed, I'll do my best to get you those answers. Thank you. No other questions? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. Mr. Stewart, while you're still available, uh, those that attended the finance meeting or had the pleasure of watching the YouTube video of the finance committee, uh, there was a couple of terms mentioned in that, and also when we had our annual report for our auditor. And uh, basically, I think we heard the term shortfall mentioned several times. And we have to look at ways to move forward. We also heard that Standard & Poor's doesn't necessarily look at your income from businesses because that is not a level, something that's going to be there, that's going to be consistent. What they look at are basically how you do on your property taxes. The city council's role that we're going to discuss tonight is to propose a referendum and a millage amount on that referendum that will get us more in line with other areas around us, will help us come up and overcome our deficit. And again, we are not the ones that approve the actual amount or the fact that it goes into place. All we're doing is trying to get a referendum that will require a vote of everyone in this city so it is the majority and the citizens that live here that make the final decision. We've already gotten very creative with what we're doing with our garbage pickup to try to do some fun saving there to help a little bit. Uh, you saw uh, this today, Birmingham announced they're actually cutting the budget to the police department where they're already something like 100 and something officers short. Uh, so there's a lot going on around us and we do not need to get to that same position. We have some of the lowest property taxes in the entire county. 
even smaller cities have larger. Uh, and these are cities that do not have school systems. So uh, we're not comparing ourselves to cities that have larger tax bases because they have a school system support. So tonight, the only discussion would be what rate would we approve to go on to a referendum and become part of a resolution that would start that referendum so Mr. Stewart, city clerk, could set that up. And we would have that referendum in when, about 2018? Uh, uh, around <laughs> April 2018. 2018. If we start things with this month and get everything in place to do it. Again, as a city councilor, you are not making a decision on the tax as far as putting it in place. You're allowing your citizenry to make a decision to either move the city forward because we've got to come up with finances somewhere. We have not had increases uh, in a lot of things <laughs> for probably uh, in, you know, over, at least over 12 years. So we've got to look at this as an alternative. And if we attract business, that's icing on the cake. But just know a business does not give you dollar for dollar return. The only way you can get that is in your property taxes. And we're way past due for it. And if we don't do it now, we're going to pay for it later. I have a question. Go ahead. I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but does all the councils have a list uh, as far as the rates, the millage, as far as the You do, and so do they, because I sent it to everybody uh, right. early last week. Okay. So everyone? I yeah. Think I, I don't have that one. Have that one. Yeah, you came. Everybody's okay, got the liberty, so that yeah, that's the one. And it's second, available second, if any of the citizens second. are interested. It's on, available yeah. on Jefferson County side. Second, okay. have we discussed if we do vote to put this on a referendum. Um, have we discussed what projects that's going to take place if this, uh, I guess, uh, vote is approved? Have we talked about projects or anything like that? Well, uh, Councilor Wilson, I think if you heard me earlier, right now we're trying to make up a deficit in our city budget. Okay. So we can, we can elect to let that deficit keep growing or we can try to at least get to a point and maybe add to that. Yeah. Then, if we want to assign projects, we can assign projects. But, so, you so know, where, so where is it most this, needed, this, we would have to prioritize that. So, right that. now, this, this, this increase in millage right. will just be to offset our deficit that we, we Potentially, have. Potentially, unless we want to add to the top. Mr. Stewart can give us an amount that would basically get us to a break-even point. And then we could look at anything we wanted to do over that and then start coming up with the type of projects we would have to go out and do a very strong campaign to everybody in this city before the referendum. But again, remember, the citizens get the final choice. Right, but I, I still think it's, it's, it's not preparing the citizens, even though, yeah, we're looking at a deficit to make up for the de deficit for the rate increase. I still think we're not doing our due diligence. Even when we break even, okay, now what we're going to do? I, I think, well, that's again, the city council, hold on, I'm not, okay. we're not finished, I'm not finished. I still think we need to do our due diligence as far as being prepared to present something to the citizens as far as what we're going to do once that that deficit is made up. We, we need to have some, some type of idea, some type of, of project or what are we looking at? Well, you know what I'm saying? Well, I think those we projects not, are probably not, already on discussion. the books. We've got road improvement. It's okay. a big one looming out there. People are wanting more green space. People, are, you know, we keep getting requests. So everything's probably been defined by the citizens. We can bring prioritize. those back up. Yeah, we would. All we would have to do is potentially prioritize. Okay. And the only reason I'm pushing this at this point is because if we delay, we'll go past 2018 and getting this into a referendum. I think I'm, the I'm education not about, part's Yeah, gone. I'm not talking about delaying. Right. I'm just saying, as far as the council having a plan. You can't enter into something without having any kind of plan that's available. I understand we're we, we behind time. Right. I get that whole picture. But in order, when we do make this kind of decision, my vision is, once we do get questions from the citizens, which we will, because when you talk about raising taxes or any or raising anything in the city, you're going to get questions. Even with the garbage thing that we're going through, we get questions. So therefore, Without doing our due diligence, I think we need to be able to respond to those questions that we get from the citizens once we decide to 
increase the millage rate. Yeah, and I agree with you. Uh, I agree with you. I think we need to. I think we need to go ahead and enter into the conversation about the increase and yes. go ahead and get a decision of whether or not we want to do the referendum. But I agree that we're going to have a lot of time between now and the vote and it actually happening. I, I would fully anticipate town hall meetings being triggered. Um, you know, citizen polling done. Um, if you're anything like me, uh, if it's not a clogged ditch or a, a pothole, I don't really hear about it much. So, I mean, those are issues that I've got going on. Those are, you know, if there's a deficit, we need to talk about the number for the break even. But I think we've all probably heard enough about what's not working in our city that we will probably already have some ideas of how we'd like our constituents to spend the money. Uh, but I do agree that they need to be engaged and. Um, I think a plan Understood. does need to be put in place. I would agree fully. I don't. I don't anticipate some millage, you know, being approved and us just, you know, I don't. I don't think they're going to let us off to just do Quite what we want to. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If we've got if we've got a deficit in the, uh, the budget to general fund, and we're doing this to raise to to make up that deficit, I don't think we ought to be putting out stuff and say, hey, give us some more money so we can do this with it. I think we need to get, uh, get the budget uh, up to uh, where, we're, where we break even or, or, or ha have enough to put in, a little bit put in the bank. But we shouldn't go out and say, raise, we won't raise your taxes so that we can do this project. I think we need to, to, get, the, uh, to get the budget up to where it uh, where it, where it leads to a break-even point and uh, where maybe we can put some reserve in the bank and not tell them we want to raise their taxes so we can go out and spend it. Where, I'd be curious to know where we need to be from a break-even standpoint. Well, I, I wanted to try to answer everybody's question is if I can <laughs> remember them. Uh, number one, Councilman Wilson's question was, uh, will there be a plan? And there will be a plan. To be able to put on a special election, you need about six months to plan for the election. It's the same type of election that we had when you all were elected to office. So there's certain things that you have to have in place. You got to have a call by a certain time, and they're just the same calendar that we use for the municipal election would be similar to the calendar that we would use uh, for the special election. It would be called the special election. We would adopt an ordinance that would have a millage rate in it that would set a special election on a certain date and time for the citizens to determine if they want the millage to be increased. Secondly, according to Councilman Bearden, is that we don't have any more revenue than we have expenses. I mean, where we are right now, our expenses far exceeds our revenue. And we are getting ready to, well, we've already lost at home. Uh, that, that will be a significant hit uh, to our sales and use tax. They were one of the top 10 uh, producers for the city, uh, but they will no longer be there next year. What are we talking about, 90, I'm sorry, about 90, 90 a year, 90,000? No, it's somewhere between 150 to 200,000 dollars a year. Okay. Uh, we also expect that Mercedes to be up and running in 2015. We borrowed money in 2014 to pay back in 2015, but we've been paying on those bonds for 2015, and Mercedes is still not opening today. Uh, they're projected to open sometime in 2018, but I'm not forecasting that that revenue will even be a part of next year's budget. And even if those funds come in, we have to give Mercedes two-thirds, and we only get to keep a third. So we are running as thin as we can with trying to reduce our expenses to be able to meet our revenues. Our expenses, 95% of our expenses are fixed. Once you take the employees and the benefits that are associated with the employees, you have contracts that the city has entered into, you have bonds that are outstanding, we only have about a million dollars in discretionary money out of $18 million. So we don't have any additional wiggle room 
unless we begin to bring in more retail, which brings in more sales and use tax, which will allow us to be able to offset whatever shortages uh, we may have. So if we don't do anything by this year, uh, then next year we will begin to get into our reserves to be able to the point that we may exhaust them. Uh, we know we also we entered into an agreement with uh, Mercedes to be able to provide the capital uh, or the infrastructure for that particular project. And everybody is stuck on two million because they said, well, we borrowed two million dollars for the road, but we're actually putting in five million dollars worth of worth of expenses. So you borrowed two, but you're spending five. So the other three million has to come from somewhere which is going to affect if we can do roads, if we can do storm drains, if we can do sidewalks. We are not putting any money aside to be able to take care of the infrastructure uh, of the city. So our expenses exceed our revenue and I don't see any additional revenue, I don't see any additional sources for the 2018 uh, fiscal year that would change that. Councilman Spivey had a question. What I was saying was, you know, if we are do have a shortfall, let's tell the people we've got a shortfall, uh, and the, the increase in the taxes is to make that up, not just to say, hey, this is okay. what we want to do with the money. Okay. I think people need to know that uh, the city's expenses, expenses are more than its revenue, and that's the reason we're raising it, not we're raising it so that we can do a project and get out here and spend that money on something else. We need to let them know why we're raising it, not just to do some project. Okay. And also, Councilman Beard, it, it all depends with that. Uh, the question was, what millage rate would we need to break even? The millage rate that we would need to break even is 10 mills. 10 mills would bring in an additional $1.5 million, which would allow us to plug the hole and also to be able to put some funds in reserve. Where are we now? Where are we now? We're we're point, 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 uh, we are the uh, we are ranked 25th out of 38 municipalities. But if you really look at the list, it's only two or three municipalities because it's about four or five of them that has the same military rate that are below us. Uh, so we we do have a, a very low military rate. Uh, if we increased it by 15 mils, that would allow us to wipe out the deficit put some money in reserve, and also have money left over to be able to do uh, capital items for our police, our fire department, parks. Uh, parks. And if we do 20 mills, that would be $4.2 million, which 10 mills could go to the operating side of the city fund budget. And then you got almost $2.7 million to be able to do projects. So it just all depends on uh, what millage rate the council recommends and how the citizens will receive uh, the presentations that will be given uh, to them. Yes, it will require a lot of education. It's going to require a lot of uh, helping people to be able to understand the process and, and where the uh, funds are going. So uh, those are just several things, several of the things that are going on. but. The reason uh, that Councilman Moreno is, is really pushing for an ordinance because it takes uh, time to be able to put an election together and hopefully while we're putting the election together we're also having what Councilman Spivey mentioned as town hall meetings, uh, neighborhood meetings, uh, Facebook discussions, uh, about all of the things that are going on so people will be educated when they get to the polls. And unfortunately we can't do any type of ordinance, resolution, or anything else without the right. I was, what I was hoping is we could just do a resolution to have a referendum. You have to attach a right to that referendum. Mr. Stewart brought me up today on that real quick. Can I check my understanding on something real quick? Okay. Alright, so uh, period ending 6.30 as far as the uh, revenue income on the budget report, uh, total uh, current total budget 18,465.30. Um, period activity, fiscal activity 14,115,290. Unfavorable variance 4.3. Uh, this was as of about 75% of the way through the budget cycle, and then. Um, 
knowing where we're at in the cycle, the money is pretty much, we're not really receiving any more income by, um, the, by the time this budget cycle ends, right? Well, what I would say, Council and Spivey, is that the budget is front loaded right. with revenue between the months of December and January. Right. We receive property tax in December, you receive business licenses in January. Right. So those are the two months that a bulk of the income comes in for the city that has to help us to make it all the way through September. So when we get to July, the only revenue we have coming in is sales and use tax. We have maybe some property tax that will trickle in, business right. license will trickle in. Uh, we have miscellaneous tax, we have the restricted like your gas tax and auto license, all of those things come in from the county. So they consistently come in uh, on a monthly basis, but they're only about $60,000 total. So when we get to July, August, and September, really the bulk of the money is sales and use tax that comes into the city. So this 4.3 unfavorable variance is the deficit that you're basically speaking that we're running at. No, right. 4.3 is the remaining amount right. of revenue that needs to come in over the next three months. But if we're on if we're on par for our spending as far as where we forecasted us to be, mm -hmm. because a lot of once again the outflow, a lot of the numbers line up with the percentage where they're supposed to be. A lot of the departments have done a very good job pacing their spending, mm -hmm. uh, but that spending is attached to a budget. And if the budget is at a shortfall because 4.3 million dollars hasn't been received then is that the deficit that we're working on? Well, the way I look at it, you have a column there that says year to date. Right. And you got a year to date column that says this is the amount of revenue that has come in. Right. This is the amount of expenses that have gone out. Right. And then that gives you where our deficit is as of June 30th. So if you had to put a number on it, what would you call it? Um, or is it right now? What was the deficit? Yes, sir. Uh, 801,000. Okay. So that's the number that I've been seeing in a lot of the back end reports. So I was kind of curious when we were talking about, you know, this millage to it. At first, it seemed like we were making the deficit sound tremendously larger than kind of what it, it seems to be on this. And I know a lot of our, our deficit is due to some of these lawsuits with Sonic and things like that. But that's new stuff. We couldn't see that coming. Right. You know, do we need to clean that up? Absolutely. And I, and I agree that we've lost some businesses that will um, kick us. Um, in the bank, um, but I'm just, I'd, I'd like to, I definitely want, I, I mean, I need to see some, some, some better, some better math as far as, I like what you're saying, uh, but I want to see it, I need to really need to see it kind of dialed in as best we can. Okay. Because I'm remembering from our last, one of our last meetings, we were talking about 4.5, was about $4.3 million, but based on your last statement, uh, and I could be mistaken, I'm sorry. Uh, if I am, um, but you know what you're saying from some of these numbers is in order to get the 4.3, we actually need to crank it out more from like a 0.15 to like a 0.2. So I guess I'm just. Um, I, I, could you? I mean, just clarify. I, I think I understand what you're okay. saying. Okay. Uh, we were I, saying about a 0 0.1 would give us about 2.6, based on I don't. Um, I'm trying 2. to remember. 2.6. 2.6 million to go towards the budget. That was that was. Oh, you're talking about the two million over to the mill. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm talking about like okay. No, ten mills would ten mills would give us one point six. Yeah. Okay, I don't know where I was getting two point six from, and then I was getting point one five was about four point three. Am I totally off base on that? Uh yes, we okay. we I, and I'll go back, but initially it was supposed to be ten mills would generate one point six. Okay. Fifteen mills would generate two point six, uh, two point seven. 20 mils would create 4.2. Okay. And I think that's probably what you heard the last time. Gotcha. Okay. I thought you were talking about the the uh, revenue versus expenditures. Mm -hmm. That's why I was. I jumped. I jumped. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Stewart. I was following you. Though. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. From your perspective, what would be an absolute day we would have so to do for in order to get the process in. going we'll get so we could have a referendum in 2018? I mean, I would say probably no later than the first council meeting in September. And we got plenty of time to get some questions answered. So, because I mean, tonight I was prepared to make a decision, you know.
uh, I knew where Mar was at, but um, that was a place that we could take it, but yeah. I don't want to to rush it or want anybody to feel like anything is just being rammed down well, there. Well, let's, well, let's well, ask this. Uh, well, if we decide on the village, I want to know how the money is going to be spent besides the, a deficit. I mean, we can say deficit. But what plan do you have in place? Well, that's I mean, what we all have plans. plans. Yeah, well, that's that's really where the you know that would be the thing that the council will work out after yeah. after you determine what the village will be because I mean if you try to sit and develop a plan before you pass the millage rate, then we'll miss this year. And we would just say we'll just say 2019. I think we could probably uh, have some high level okay. numbers, so I don't think we have to drill down into the minutia of the specifics. But uh, I'm sure we could probably have a high level number. Yeah. Okay, if, if we, we agree to do this, we've got a deficit. If, we already know where the money is going to be spent. It's if going if to anybody at this time tonight has a question that relates to James' expertise, would y'all please try to get with him before the next council meeting? Let's go ahead. Remember, our next council meeting won't be till the 17th because of the election. So Thursday night, right. so we right. have to do this by end of next month for us Correct. to make the cutoff. So right. the question so is, do we want to do another work session on that Monday before the council meeting, or do we want to do it on the Monday before the next, the first council meeting in September, and bring this to a conclusion? I mean, did you have anything? I think we need to go ahead and do it that way. Go ahead and do it. So go ahead and mark your calendar for 5:30 on the. Oh, that the uh, 14th? Yeah. That Monday, yes. Please. Thank you. And that way, but in the meantime, please get with James. And it would be important, I think, uh, in that work session, uh, the mayor apologizes for not being here. He's on the road, but uh, having everybody in the room because it's going to affect us from top to bottom in the city. But look around us and see what's not happening in the other municipalities right now because of revenues. One thing I'll just add in is that between now and then, we will definitely be getting with James and probably even the mayor uh, to make sure that we don't exceed any limits that are set by statute or constitution yeah. because there is a, a level that we could hit where we could still go higher, but it would require legislative action. Okay. And so we need to make sure that, that we just have that as. But that basically gives us two weeks to get some of those T's crossed and I's dotted and move forward. Does everybody feel comfortable with that? Again, tonight was only for discussion because it still has to come to us at a regular council meeting. Okay. Sam, our pop, excuse me. I just wanted to ask, how long has it been at 0.65 mils? Correct. Sure. Middle East, 12 years. I was here at the council meeting. We went back to, uh, I mean, we went back to the tax assessor records. Um, well, almost back to before they start keeping it on the computer, and it's been 6.5 for 30 years. I mean, it's, right. ever, ever since it, the Muslim municipality has had a millage, we we've, we've been at 6.5. Now, now I can I can recall a dozen years ago, my council member sitting where Bobby Joe is got up and presented. Uh, we can go raise the sales tax by a penny or we can raise the property tax and the people voted. I was understanding that people voted to raise the property tax and then six months later they raised the, the sales tax another penny anyway. Steve, thank you. Uh, I think it would probably help. I know this is getting videotaped and y'all are going to talk about it, but it might help to let them know what the increase on each mill is so they can be thinking in dollars and cents when y'all continue your discussion. Is dollar every thousand? Um, um, on one, on. Yes, the, the easiest math for me, but what I want to do is to uh, find the medium house income in the city of Irondale, and we'll kind of use that as an example, but right now we just use $100,000 because it's easy to do the math for it, but 10 mils would be an additional $100 annually, 15 mils will be $150 annually, and 20 mils will be $200 additionally annually to, to the property tax bill. Per 100,000. Per 100,000. So a $200,000 house is going to be $300 at the one point. Well, 200, 300, and 400. Right. Every mill would be $100, $100 on 100,000? Correct. Yeah. Basically, yes. 
And, I, and I, I really like the way that you explained this, how that if we go to this mill, here's our additional revenue. We go to this mill, additional revenue. And I think that'll do, that type of explanation will, will go, go across the, the city so people go, oh, okay, now I understand what's going on here. Now, yes, you're gonna get pushback for what are we gonna do with this money and making sure that you know, we uh, broadcast the information that you know, this is gonna help fill in our holes, get us to a point, and then we'll have the money to do the projects that everybody wants. And then at that point, but like I said, y'all have to kind of figure out exactly quickly which mill you want to go to and <clears throat> shove it out there and sell it. Any other questions? I just also want to say I think it's important that the citizens know that this 6.5 has been set for over 30 for 30 years or so. Oh. That's very important. Oh, I don't think it's been that long. I think it's been sure. 20. Well, I've been living That's in Arendelle for 27. I can't it hadn't changed since I've been here. I've been here since 1990. That's, that's a long time. Well, thank you, everybody. It would be a selling point for the city, too, though. I mean, for all the things I look at. Well, it's, it's still hard to sell. It's kind of like even on the uh, Valley Georgia, so where people don't understand, you still have to sell them out for the landfill, so your costs don't necessarily go down. So it's it's I mean, going you, to be something. You can look at it from this standpoint. Think all the I, if you were getting. Uh, let's just use layman's term, uh, $20,000 a year for 27 years. You've been working 27 years and you're still getting $20,000. That would be very unjust. And I think we need to give these kinds of examples so that people understand what you're talking about. Ms. Stewart, you want to excuse yourself? Okay. Yeah. You still good for a little bit? So thank you, James, for breaking that down again. Appreciate I did have those problem. notes in my folder. Again, the, so, ball, yeah. the ball is rolling, clock is ticking. All we've got to do is follow up. But please, in the interim, so when we get to this point of discussion at the next work session, you've got a lot of this answered for you by going to James individually, and then we can bring it all together. That's right. agreeable to everyone. All right? Mr. Sims, our apologies. We're running a little bit behind here, but you're welcome to take your time. You've got your 30 minutes of claim if you need it. But we, we can Darryl, tell you. Darryl we and Cindy need to leave, I think. Huh? Darryl and Cindy, I would say, think need to leave while he interviews. It's a public meeting. Well, you, you can't. You, you, he's Daryl's going to interview too. Let's see. It is a public meeting. You certainly can request anybody to leave if, if they wouldn't be legally required to, but I would you certainly request. I would request that, that the, those. Applying for the job and interviewing and be not, not be present while the others are interviewing. That's my request. <laughs> I don't think it's fair. So, so one so we're, left, we're losing a little more counsel. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wilson, though, we'll be having a mosquito discussion before it's over. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, we're going to spray it so how. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, we, we have your resume, so I think everybody's had a real chance to review that. I think what your job is is to sell yourself. Why, why, you're on the CDA currently. Why should you remain on the CDA? What do you see as the direction for the CDA? How do your qualifications fit into the CDA, et cetera? All right. Uh, first, I'll start and say I don't envy your position of talking about raising taxes. <laughs> no, I do support it. I think uh, I've actually looked at military breaks in the last couple months for an investor out of town, and uh, I was alarmed at how low they were. So uh, there's places I've never heard of that have more millets than we do. So I think you've got your work cut out, out for you, but uh, I support it, and I feel like it can bring some new revenue in. Um, I was finishing out a term, so I guess I've served a little over a year, and I uh, hope to have a chance to do a full term. Um, as you can see, my background's in real estate, Currently, so uh, I guess that's kind of what I've been focused on for the last uh, years, just kind of helping out in that area. Um, uh, we've got, I talked to someone the last month, yeah, looking for warehouse space in the area, um, just you know, stuff like that, uh, you know, trying to find somewhere maybe we can bring people in, and, you know, like you know, there's a deficit in the retail, so. 
I would like to be able to help bring in someone and in that area, I guess. Um, I keep saying if I heard about this. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we just came back, actually, uh, three of us from the EDAA summer conference in Economic Development Association of Alabama, and uh, that was my first opportunity to do that, and that was very eye-opening. I guess it allowed me to see a lot of stuff that I was unaware of, so you know, I didn't know what I didn't know, and so there's so much opportunity out there that I think we, we as a city have been leaving on the table or not going after because we didn't maybe know it existed, so i uh, found a lot of people there and it's kind of seeing, uh, met the uh, Department of Commerce uh, representative for Alabama, who actually lives here in, lives in, uh, in uh, Avondale. And just talking to him about what he does for people, he basically takes support for anybody having issues with people overseas. Uh, Scott Green has called him on occasion, importing stuff, dyes for his stuff, or he's even, you know, stuff when he's distributing out of the country. And uh, yeah, he helps people that he's, they send stuff across the sea and they don't get payment. You know, hey, this is so-and-so from the U.S. Embassy. Now they get paid. And I think a lot of small businesses, which we have a lot of in Irondale, maybe are afraid to try to maybe sell internationally. Because I would be afraid, hey, what if I send my stuff over to somewhere, some other country, and they don't pay me, what am I going to do? Well, now we know, well, you've got this guy here that can help you. And so maybe you know we can have a workshop. Who's, you know, what small businesses are here that would be interested, but you don't know about it, can learn. Maybe we can expand your businesses that way um, by alleviating some of their fears. Um, met a uh, new guy at Norfolk Southern, and uh, you know, talked to him a little bit about. We always talk. We've got rail, but do we really have businesses or places along in our that can access rail? He was actually uh, looking into that and talking to the engineers because if we're going to town it, you know, I want to make sure we can provide it if we find someone that, that's their big selling point. Um, I don't know. I was coming kind of expecting to have questions. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, they're not too inquisitive prepared. So yeah, feel, relax and feel comfortable. I think the one thing we found out that I, the, at the uh, CDA level is Irondale has a lot of property. But because of topography and understructure being rock, <laughs> a lot of the property is not as commercially developable as we would like it to be. We think we've got all this land that people would just be willing to grab, but the reason they don't grab it is because it's not necessarily something they can turn and make useful without going into a higher expense that they would normally put into the base. So that's been one of the issues that uh, Aaron's been looking at as he looks at property because we know that up front when we go into something. Our best piece of property right now is the old hospital property, and that's probably everything's there, infrastructure, the whole nine yards, and it's flat, which is another thing we don't have much of. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's been one of his challenges, even looking for warehouse space. We think we've got a lot of warehouse space, but we really don't have warehouse space. We have empty buildings. Right. <laughs> um, talking about rock, I, I drive by the Mercedes, Mercedes getting built at least two times a day, sometimes three, and just, they're just hauling rock. <laughs> out of there constantly. I, I, I imagine in my head there's a huge hole back there somewhere, but, um, but yeah, hopefully that'll come up soon. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, we, uh, we met and I got to hear uh, one of the guys that works for Barber Companies who volunteers a lot of his time to Barber Motorsports and talking about uh, tourism and economic development and how they correspond. And, that's another area where I think we're missing the boat because they're right there, they're one exit away, and there's people that come in and spend so much money when they go to races, when they come to the driving school. And he was talking about also different companies who, for years, have been wanting to relocate to right outside of Barber, but they don't have anything ready. And my question is, okay, tell me what ready is, and let's, if Leeds is going to do it, because if you've gone to Bass Pro, you've gone to Barber, it looks like there's a ton of flat land out there, but apparently it's not ready. I don't know. So I'm going to find out, you know, from these people that are doing that. So what is ready? What, what do we need to have? What does it need to look like? Because once they tell us that, then, you know, all right, now we know what we need to have, provide, and, you know, let's 
capital loss and what lead is missing out on. I'm tired of you know, stuff going out. Let's take some of their stuff. It's my opinion. Being on the current CEA, what do you see as a challenge for you as a member of the CEA? I feel like you know the last year I've kind of all right. I figured out you know what we're doing, what the role is, I guess, and now I feel like you know I can really kind of focus on stuff, and we can really. I, I think anybody that's involved in trying to bring retail in, and anybody we've talked to has talked about how it's a two, three, four, <clears throat> sometimes five year process before you start, before you have whatever you know a location like built and operating and uh, so I just want to be able to see something through I guess. Um, I guess the challenge is just uh, making the right connections at the moment or you know which I think we're start, I'm starting to do now that I met a ton of people this last weekend and I'm hoping they can provide me some other uh, people to talk to but uh, you know we're I think we're going in the right direction we just need to uh, kind of Keep going and expand, and hopefully, uh, I don't know where I was going with that. Um, Terry, do you mind rephrasing your question? Again? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Uh, several years ago, the city financed the purchase of a building for the CDA, and the CDA uh, at the time, the uh, city was receiving the monthly rent off of this building. Uh, about four years ago, the CBA took uh, went to the to the rentor uh, and uh, had them direct redirect the the rent to the CDA in the amount of about seventeen thousand dollars a month. That's that's a little over two hundred thousand dollars a year that's coming to the CBA that I feel like should be coming to the city uh, general fund. If you're reappointed to the CDA, we'll, uh, how do you feel uh, where this money should go? I feel like it should come back to the city and not the CDA. Uh, from what I understand, you know, over four years, that's over $800,000 that the uh, CDA has received in rent on this one building. And from what I understand, the CDA currently has about $250,000 in its uh, account. Now, we know where about 100,000 of it went when it was, uh, we had a problem with one of the CDA members a year or so ago. But that still leaves $450,000 that uh, that's accounted for from, the, uh, from this $800,000 worth of rent. Do you uh, foresee any, uh, that you would be in favor of of the city receiving this rent instead of the CDA, or do you think the CDA should retain, uh, should continue to receive the rent for this building? That's a tough one. Um, I don't know what happened originally, like obviously, because I was not on the CDA. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you but, what uh, happened. I'll tell you what happened. The uh, the uh, CDA treasurer stole approximately $98,000. That, that I knew about. Okay, yeah. that's what I I, I I mean, the original purchase transaction, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, I don't know how that worked. Um, I, I do know money is coming in. I think mean, I'll be able to that's all that we have as far as revenue. Um, as far as, um, so um, I guess my thoughts are that we have the money coming in and we need to use it to expand um, commercial development, I guess. So, you know, whether it's finding one of these parcels that are ready to go and either the CA doing the city a job, purchasing it, selling it, and making a business happen there, um, using that to, uh, I guess, as our leverage for, you know, doing that. Uh, that would be my goal, I guess, is to somehow, in the next four years, you know, do a project, you know, along one of our business corridors, um, and uh, get into business in and, you know, throw the tax base through, uh, through that. Well, um, well, my, my, question, my question was, should the city receive this $17,000 a month rent, or should the CDA continue to receive it? I guess being in real estate and very contract heavy, I mean, I, 
I don't know what's in the original contract. I would have to go back to read the contract because I'm assuming it's spelled out somewhere where it's supposed to go. I assume the CDA was supposed to get it because that's where it's been going since I've been on it, but I've never read any of the original purchase agreements or contracts or and I would have to just that's how it's you aware that the CDA was receiving this this amount of money oh, yes. for rent every month? Correct. You were, you were under the impression that the CDA owns that building, I'm assuming, correct? Yeah. I mean, that's why you would be well, receiving the rent, is because you yeah. assume you own it. Well, the CDA so, does own the building, right. but no, the I'm city paid for it. I understand that. I'm just thinking, I'm just talking about Aaron and his one year's worth of knowledge. I'm sure he's, he feels that the CDA deserves that money because obviously there's some ownership there. The tax record, it says yeah. the commercial is exactly. already in. Expecting him to know the backstory on that, I think, is unjust. He's actually in their name. Yeah. And to clarify, part of the funding, uh, Councilor Baird, we went to pay for the replacement of the roof on the building that we uh, that they used for their manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So some of that came out of that. Uh, you saw the recent financials. Uh, you know. Yeah, I need um, to get a copy of that. You're, you're welcome to make one of this or take it with you, just so you can yeah, get back to me or I get another. Every every meeting we go through the financials, to make sure that I guess we're all. On top of things. I'll give a copy. Just remember, as a council, what you're trying to do is pick a candidate sure. that will do the best we can. Because once they, they are their own entity, I understand. Yeah, I, that's just our want their, I just want their yeah. opinion on uh, my concern. And when you when you look at this, you'll see a lot of expenditures. And the question is, is the public getting back something for that amount of expenditure, especially in certain areas? And again, the reason for the audit. No. And, and the biggest and, question on the audit. Is are we following state statute doing what the CDA is doing? Well, in the, in the past, the, the, uh, the, the council budgeted money for the CDA. But they gave up that privilege. And, yep. When they, when, when, when they decided to take take over that rent payment, yeah, that that was stopped. But right. uh, and the, the CDA was required by the council to stay within that budget. We uh, one thing we've done right lately is you know I guess. That building's insurance had been in some big umbrella insurance with the city, which we just, I think, separated out from that. Yes. The company that, you know, we're getting the rent, we're going to pay for the insurance, for instance. And uh, so I guess that's one thing we're done lately is hey, you know, there's no point in the city. If, if, mm -hmm. if it's our building, we need to pay for the insurance, we need to pay for all the yeah. stuff, like the roof. And, yeah, I understand all this happened for anybody that's on CDA now, it came, you know, came on the right. CDA. But uh, I didn't know how you feel about if you feel the same way I do or not. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I didn't go any of the original. He, he like, gave a good political answer. Yeah, yeah. I understand. <laughs> I like to take that money and get a little bit for any, any specific questions. So, that, that's that's any, my question. Right there. That, but that's it. Here, do you have any additional comments you'd like to make? Uh, no, not okay. really. Thank you. We just appreciate your willingness to put your hat in the ring. Thank you. Right. If you just go and if you step up to the next area, just give them long enough to do that. Anybody else want to make a pit stop? No, sir. Good for right now. Been drinking, Thank you. Been, been drinking that McDonald's all afternoon. Trying to keep from dying of fur to that heat. I think Leslie needs some McDonald's. <laughs> David, just in a uh, general conversation while he's out, just be sure and follow up with James. Because you've got no, a lot of questions, and that way he can well, make I had more it, comfortable. Because I, I see what you're talking about, uh, comparing one apples to apples. Yeah, and I had it in my notes, and that's what I was saying as he was leaving, is I had it in my notes the way he reiterated it. I just I focused on, I just got it a little jumbled up in my brain. Um, but uh, he was, he was, I would still like to see um, his deficit numbers. I would. I would like to see how any millage increase would eliminate that deficit. I under there has to be some education because I understand that those taxes have to be spent in a certain way. They have to go to various departments before they can go to capital improvements, and that's. I think that's key is that people understand that. Uh, but at the same time, we. I know there. There's things we've got to do around this town. We. We have to do some things and. Um, you know, I think I might be willing to go somewhere I was. I thought I was previously uncomfortable with, but um, it is what it is. Again, remember, uh, we're just a recommending body almost on this one. 
uh, we're putting it out there and it takes a, uh, and you know how those campaigns go, it depends on which faction gets out and campaigns most, so, and gets the voters out. Because yeah, this can't be a multiple choice type of question, can it? <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> you know? It's all or nothing. Um, so, I think if we, if we do, if we're very clear about our plan, that will be helpful. Well, I thank you all for your patience tonight so far. Appreciate it. There we go. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? All right. All right, we said my turn. Well, uh, just start off, I guess we learned from the first that basically we have your resume in hand. So I guess basically talk more about your role, which, why you should be re up to the CDA, those type things. Uh, if you want to throw in some of your resume, you're welcome to, but we have all your background and what's going on there. Terry has one specific question he's asking everybody, and then we'll make some general comments and let the counselors ask any questions at all. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, I've served on the CDA since 2013, uh, became chairman in 2014, and um, during that time, uh, we have accomplished a lot as an organization. Um, we've had some ups and downs, but primarily, uh, we have prided ourselves on being a proactive CDA. Uh, whereas traditionally the CDA has kind of been um, reactive uh, to a particular project that may come through or reactive to uh, a particular issue where they would get together, deal with that issue, and, uh, and then disperse. Uh, but when um, we became together the, the uh, initial core nucleus of the CDA, we, we made a concerted effort to truly uh, become adv advocates and uh, diplomats for the city in terms of uh, trying to work on you know what is core in economic development. Uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, I've been uh, indirectly and directly involved in economic development for over 12 years. Uh, with AT&T, uh, I, I handle specifically local municipalities, I handle uh, county governments. You know, I was also selected in uh, 1995 when I worked in Columbus to serve on the search committee to bring uh, the Olympic softball uh, venue to Columbus, Georgia. So uh, my, my background is economic and business development, uh, primarily sales and uh, marketing. And uh, why do I want to be uh, on the CDA and continue to serve on the CDA? Uh, it's my love for Irondale. Uh, it's the uh, enormous potential that we have. It's uh, the, uh, really the competitive aspect of uh, ceasing to be that city that people pass through. Uh, I think uh, through the CDA as well as other boards and agencies, we really have a great opportunity to take Irondale to another level, a sustained level of growth. Uh, so, um, I would love to continue to serve on the CDA uh, because, as I said, I, I've been on the CDA since 2013, but I became chairman in 2014. And um, in that, since that time, uh, we have done really some uh, tremendous uh, works in terms of uh, programs from the Business of the Month program, where uh, we work on uh, business retention and expansion um, in, in that program. We have built some great relationships with uh, current businesses, uh, and we've also uh, formed partnerships with them through that program. Uh, also, um, we seek to become a professional economic development organization. Uh, personally, uh, my leadership style has been that if you have talented people, you let the people uh, utilize their talents, and I've been blessed. Uh, in my tenure of chairman to have some, some folks that love Irondale, and some folks that uh, were content in not just uh, being a member of a board, but truly uh, rolling up their sleeves and doing work. So uh, I'd like to continue the momentum we have. We'd love to work with this council, uh, this current council that we have. I, I, I know each and every counselor on both the professional and a personal level, and I think working together cohesively along with the mayor's office, the sky's the limit in terms of what we can accomplish. So that's kind of my spiel of why I would like to seek a second term. Um, I'm here to answer any questions uh, in terms of uh, what you may uh, have in terms of the future or the past or, or whatever the case may be. Mr. Spivey, you want to read off, please? 
baby. Good evening. <laughs> I like the bass in your voice, sir. Thank you. <laughs> um, actually, I want to defer to Terry on this because you've been asking the same question consistently all evening. I'd really like to uh, have you pose this question to Daryl and then um, maybe have a follow up question after that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Daryl, uh, approximately four years ago, and I don't know this was before you were on the CDA, but uh, the city financed a, uh, a building for purchase by the CDA, and the rent for the building was coming to the city, to the general fund. And approximately four years ago, just before you got on the CDA, uh, members of CDA and one of our council members went to the... Uh, uh, the owner and have the rent deferred to by payment to the CDA instead of the city. And from what I understand that the uh, CDA is receiving a rent payment of approximately $17,000 a month from this building. I feel like that this is money that the city purchased the uh, supplied the money to purchase the building and I feel like the rent should come to the to the city as it uh, originally did. Uh, if you're reappointed to the CDA, will you, in your opinion, will you uh, uh, work to have that money deferred back to the city general fund, or do you think the CDA should continue to receive that money? Um, well, I'm open to uh, having the, the dollars come back to the CDA, but I mean, come back to the city. I, however, you know, in my research, CDAs are funded various ways. Uh, uh, some CDAs have a direct uh, amount that comes from the council to uh, fund their economic development activity. Uh, since I've been on the CDA, uh, the dollars that we receive from that building, we have worked diligently to try to reinvest those dollars back into the community. Uh, uh, by owning that building, uh, I know exactly the situation you speak of. Well, uh, ownership has some responsibility. Uh, probably about three years ago, uh, we had to pay $75,000 to put a new roof on that building. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, uh, a, a prime uh, tenant with IBML, which is one of the city's largest employers uh, in that building. So, uh, of course, we have to do our due diligence to keep them in the building and keep them happy. Uh, I've always said, even at an early stage, perhaps there should be some type of management agreement uh, that's created between the CDA uh, to where the CDA manages the building, uh, and from a, a resource standpoint, perhaps uh, there could be in that agreement a certain amount of funding that comes to the CDA in terms of what we need to do from an economic development standpoint. Um, that building, uh, I, I know the history, it, it is a bone of contentment. Uh, for some, I, I think that during my tenure, uh, the dollars have never reverted back to the city. Uh, and with that, what we have tried to do is be uh, good stewards of those dollars because, you know, economic development is, is, a, is a contact sport. You, you have to kind of make some investment into it uh, to get the, the returns that, that, that you want. So to answer your question, I'd be open to sitting down with the city uh, to see how we can uh, basically have those dollars go to the city with uh, some of those funding, some of that funding coming to the CBA because one of the things we tried to do with the CDA was look for other opportunities where we can create a, a revenue stream outside of those dollars. Well, prior to the, uh, the CDA receiving the rent from this property, the city funded the CDA totally. The city council had it in our, our budget. And once they started receiving that, uh, that rent payment, that was cut off because it was far in excess of what the CDA was receiving from the city. So you, th you say you would be in favor of, of that money coming, that rent payment coming back to the city or a portion of it? Oh, sure, sure. Um, when, I, when I look at, uh, you know, I, I'm a big proponent in research. Uh, so Pelham recently started the CDA. Uh, I think they fund their CDA with something like $200,000 uh, a year. Uh, one of the things they're looking to do is find a, a full-time person to run their CDA. Uh, Gaston CDA kind of does the same thing. The dollars come from the city to mm -hmm. fund the economic development activities. We are an anomaly. When I talk to CDAs around the, the state, uh, one, having a building that the CDA owns in terms of the, the legal terms, 
uh, it creates a, a different situation. You know, one, as you said, the city does not need to fund the CBA because uh, their funding comes from a major revenue stream. And to that point, what we've done over the last couple of years was if uh, we are receiving the dollars for that building, then we should pay the insurance, which is uh, one thing that we're doing. Uh, we should also take care of any repairs, uh, and we should be the owners of the relationship with uh, the tenant that's in that building. Uh, you know, uh, some people say, well, hey, the city shouldn't be in the real estate business. Well, that's really kind of why you have a CDA or an industrial development uh, board so that you can have a, an authority that can manage those uh, types of things outside of the city. Okay, thank you. Did that correct anything you? Yeah, no, you, you answered kind of two questions there that I kind of had floating around in my head as well, so thank you for that. Um, one other thing, um, the the deck by the caboose that was a proposed project um, there was um, some dialogue back and forth on that um, without putting you on the spot and feel free to answer accordingly uh, do you feel that that was a good project for the CDA and then um, do you feel that that could have been done or proposed to be done a little differently um, well, that uh, that project was probably two, two and a half years in the making, um, right. and every step of the way, uh, you know, the CDA has uh, legal counsel uh, from the city. Uh, prior to Leslie, uh, there the, the legal counsel representing the CDA was on board with that project, and, and I tell you, the emphasis of that project was, as I said, you know, we're receiving funds uh, from this uh, real estate uh, transaction that we have so our thought has been how can we best reinvest those funds to where the city does not have to tap the general fund and uh, so the uh, thought there was when uh, when you look at economic development and some of the fundamentals uh, one of the core fundamentals is real estate development and reuse and I saw that as an opportunity we saw that because it was not an autonomous decision that I made an opportunity to step in and uh, basically create a landmark uh, for the city that was already being used, pretty much already popular, and we saw that as an opportunity to utilize CDA funds to bring that uh, particular uh, property uh, to uh, a better use. And so opposed to having to go through the council and tap the general fund, we saw that as that's, that's one of the, the reasons the CDA is there. Uh, one of the things we tried to do in being the shepherds of the public funds was, again, we always tried to reinvest those funds into the city. Uh, one of the uh, advantages of the CDA is, of course, we don't have to have a, a council meeting every time to disperse that fund. Those funds, we do it through the board. And the board overwhelmingly, after looking at the comprehensive plan, uh, after kind of studying how can we create something that's low-hanging fruit, that be a catalyst for downtown. Uh, you live in downtown Irondale. If you look at that caboose, uh, having had an office in that caboose, it is an enormous opportunity for tourism, for a meeting place, and we saw it as if we could uh, provide the funds and the city would, would not have to. We saw that as being a, a, a good investment into city property, because right now, it's just sitting there. Uh, uh, this particular season, um, if you pass through Irondale on any weekend, you can see upward 50 to 100 folks. And as we talk to those folks when we have an office in the caboose, they love uh, watching trains in Irondale because it offers a unique experience. You're close to the train tracks and you get a two-sided view. So to answer your question, uh, you know, we were looking at how can we utilize these funds for good? And uh, we all agree and uh, pursue that uh, what if we could redo the caboose, uh, possibly turning it into uh, a landmark, either a visitor center, uh, which would draw tourism, which is uh, always an economic development up to, and also become kind of a landmark and a meeting place for the city. Because you know, on any given day, weekdays or weekends, people are using the caboose, we're just looking to make it more viable. Thank you. The, uh, the thing, uh, Darrell, are you aware that the CDA in its minutes actually voted to turn that money over to the city back around the first part of your term and it's never been done? 
Uh, well, you know, we had a, a hiccup when we were told at first we couldn't do it. Uh, we was a poor all system, though, uh, and then we were told that we probably needed to kind of uh, backtrack, but those dollars are there, uh, and we are more than willing to work with the city in any kind of way. Uh, you know, from a visioning standpoint, as I said, that, that space could be a great uh, welcome center, could be a visitor center, could be a location for one of our uh, other entities, uh, historical society, what have you. Uh, but, you know, right now, uh, we're more than willing to work with the city in any kind of way. Uh, I think the quotes that we received, uh, the best quote was somewhere around $8,000, and we have more than enough uh, in our savings to cover that. So we, we would definitely be more than open to uh, look at that again. Any additional questions from the council? Mm -hmm. uh, you've, you've heard your three candidates. Uh, oh, excuse me. I've got one. Sure. Since you've been on the um, on, on the board, and you served as chairman on the board. Mm -hmm. As a citizen, and Terry brought this up, but eighty-six thousand dollars gone missing. Were you the chairman at that time? Oh uh, yes, I was. Now, what I read online is there were two signatures for everything, and just because Irondale Short, what what can you ensure that being back on the board that that money's not going to get misguided again? Oh, certainly, uh, Bill. Um, that's kind of uh, part of doing business. You're going to always have hiccups. And what we did, uh, uh, we basically put some mechanisms in place to ensure that that wouldn't happen. One of the first things we did was we became more transparent with the city. The city clerk uh, now has direct access uh, to the city. Now, I'm talking about before then, when the money went missing, how did $86,000 when you're doing financial reports and you have a board and you're looking at it, mm -hmm. that, because I'm assuming it's like my bank statement, if all of a sudden there's $10,000 gone, well, somebody would be asking me what I did with $10,000. Well, um, uh, I, you know, of course we are a board and one of the things uh, that happens with uh, any time you're looking at improprieties, uh, we were presented uh, a snapshot every month at board meetings. Uh, whereas even previously we weren't given that, however, there was never any detail given. And so we So y'all didn't look at the checking account or the accounts? Uh, at that time, we looked at the bank statements. However, the full bank statements were not given. Uh, and uh, so we were looking at uh, every month uh, we would have a financial report. We would see a uh, balance coming in and a balance coming out. And from that uh, look, we could not see anything that stood out. So it was a report. Uh, yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a report given. It was basically the front page of the bank statement was given uh, with not a whole lot of details. And during the time, uh, we weren't traveling a whole lot, so there weren't any uh, need to kind of go into detail in terms of specific transactions. But uh, that was made available to the entire board, not just me. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the, the thing about uh, when situations like that happens is what do you do going forward? So. We've put several mechanisms in place since then. Uh, we're currently interviewing auditors so that the CBA can have their own uh, independent auditor. Uh, we now require three different signatures for checks. Uh, we hired an office manager so that board members would not be encumbered with the role of treasury or treasurer. And uh, you know, it's an unfortunate thing, but uh, we we all uh, we all have basically taken the stance that. Going forward, we've got to do better. So uh, going going forward and doing better, we put in safeguards. Uh, and I think having our in, an independent auditor will help. Uh, there's more transparency with the CBA books than there's ever been in history because the city clerk uh, basically handles our books. So it was uh, an unfortunate, unfortunate event, but uh, going forward, I'm more than certain that we will not have that problem again. If you attend any one of our board meetings now. There's a detailed accounting of not only what our balances are, but to the level of every transaction that takes place. So the balance is raising, because what what I was understanding from you, Terry, is the balance is still fairly low with 17000 coming in a month. Uh, well, uh, it, two, that's $200,000 a year, a little over $200,000 a year. Received in the uh, what I got this morning, 
James was they got about 250,000 in the banks, and I, I think it was like $98,000 that talked about that it should uh, be about disappeared. That. We know where it went, you know, and that's being handled by the police. But that's still these four hundred fifty thousand dollars over the last four years has been spent. Yeah, um, and let me just speak to in terms of where the current balance are. Uh, you all know about the infamous lawsuit. Uh, the CDA had uh, fifty five thousand dollars that came out of CDA funds in relation to uh, the Paris Heart lawsuit. Uh, as I said, we paid seventy five thousand about two years ago to put a brand new roof on that mm -hmm. and uh, we have uh, part of the circulating dollars into the community. We have definitely uh, funded uh, community uh, development events as well as organizations. Uh, $10,000 went to the chamber to have the first ever city guide back in 2015. Uh, we funded uh, over about $10,000 toward the uh, Iron Yellow Moon Comprehensive Plan. The CBA funded all public engagement events. They funded the uh, website and also other things. So uh, I'm more than confident now uh, that with the safeguards we put in place, that will not be a, a problem going forward. Uh, you know, uh, I, I've been in business for 35 years, and people are crafty. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes they <laughs> slip through the crack. Uh, I think the key is what do you do afterwards? And what do you do to prevent that from uh, happening again? I mean, David being in banking, I'm sure. Uh, you know, people can come up with some uh, pretty grandiose schemes, and I mean, even the smartest folks. Uh, I, I can remember this week and attest to this. I mean, we all were baffled when that happened um, because we have an attorney on our board, we have a, a retired. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, nobody board. nobody was, was looking over the, the accountant's. Uh, we were, Shoulder, so to speak, right. to see we were, what you're doing with yeah, it. Yeah, we were looking at the, every meeting, there was a bank statement. Now, prior to uh, us being on the board, there wasn't even bank statements yet. So mm -hmm. it was like a step up, and now we're seeing bank statements. Yeah. But with the regime prior to then, as you know, there was an issue there. Uh, we were just told, hey, we got plenty of money. Yeah. So we <laughs> kind of created a ruckus. Mm -hmm. We had never even seen bank statements. So. Uh, it's unfortunate, but you know it happens in just about uh, in some organizations. Again, the key is what do you do going forward, and, and I'm more than confident going forward, working with the city, working with an independent auditor, uh, working with uh, really an independent bookkeeper in James. Uh, we don't get more transparent uh, to the city than where we are now. Then uh, I just want to make a point. Yeah. Um, I served on the CDA back in 2007, 2008, and what he just said. And then none of us were here. Well, Terry Bearden was actually a city councilman then. And we didn't have the benefit of a city attorney like Leslie. Um, the city attorney at that time actually ran the CDA meetings. And the kind of money that was spent to go out to Vegas and do absolutely nothing, they were surprised that I actually went to the conference halls. Because Ignorant Bliss, my first year there, I thought I was actually supposed to go and do some work for the city. So we didn't even have bank statements. We didn't have reports. We didn't have anything. You're talking about Greg Morrison, the uh, attorney running <laughs> that which is Yes, Terry. Okay. <laughs> right. I really, that was, I really that was, wasn't going to say that. That's names. the first time you were, or the last time you were on the CDS. I was on the CDS. Yeah. And, and, you know, I really raised a fuss there to the point that that particular city attorney made sure I was not on the CDA anymore. So it has gradually gotten better. And it was a blessing to me to be reappointed to the CDA because just being involved as a, as a, as a citizen, I saw the difference. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to jump back on that team because our city is great, all of us love it. And now, now we have a team that can actually get something done. So that'd be good. Yeah, and, and to that point, we, we have done. Gentlemen, I think at this point, I do have one. Go ahead, question. please. Um, is there. There's been a, a decent amount of time between the Cheryl Daniels deal and now. And I know you're going through and you're interviewing auditors now to conduct an audit. Um, was there a particular reason why an audit wasn't done shortly thereafter the Cheryl Daniels case? Just to see, like, okay, let's really figure out where we're at. Well, actually, it was the audit yeah. that uh, brought the issue to light. Okay. Okay, okay. 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 gotcha. Okay. 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 From the historical standpoint, yeah. uh, there was a uh, continued 
reluctant to providing all of the necessary okay. documentation for Fair the enough. audit. Uh, then when it was expressed to me that there was some variances, I went to James, who went to the then mayor, uh, Tommy Joe Alexander, and everything kind of rolled from there. I think Tommy um, Joe and, and James got the, the bank statements from the bank to, and showed mm -hmm. where all the money went. Right. I wasn't sure how y'all caught it. Yeah. I didn't realize it was an actual audit. They caught it. A continuum. So. She would give partial information for the audit. Uh, then we had a meeting, and then when I found out that there was some variances, uh, my first order of business was I need to tell the city. So I told James and the mayor, and it rolled downhill from there. As an update, uh, she has uh, with us that probably two months ago, she's gone through uh, the, the legal system. She is now serving restitution. Definitely not the amount we want for money, <laughs> uh, but uh, we're, we're working diligently to totally put that in the rearview mirror. So she's paying restitution. If she misses a payment, correct me, Leslie, there's a possibility for jail time. And uh, so uh, it, it was a long time coming, but, but we can finally say we kind of see that in the rearview mirror. Thank you. And she's not the first employer we've had to mis misappropriate funds. Yes, sir, we'll say it happens. Just, just make a closing comment on this. As a member of the council, mm -hmm. I charge you with number one, go online, look at state statute as to what the purpose of the CDA is and what they can do with the funding. Consider that when you're making your decision. Look at the qualifications of your three candidates. See what would serve the council the best since we have no control once we appoint that person. So you're trying to put the person in there you feel most comfortable will do the job the council wants them to do. And has, that's your charge. Has James got you all the, the preferred readings of the... Uh, We've all had that. The question is how many people it, read it. It explains it, it, explains yeah. it thoroughly. In and how many, but how many people read it, Terry? That's the key. Mm -hmm. And we've got to make sure. Now, what we're calling for this time, hopefully it happens, is a full audit. An audit that looks at both operational parameters against state statute as well as financial and results in a thorough top to bottom like the city does every year. What we had before was strictly a quick, dirty financial mm -hmm. just to look at the numbers, and that's how we came up with the eighty thousand dollars. So again, that's what your job will be when it's time to make a decision. The only other thing we might consider is the audit. Hopefully, after an interview tomorrow, an auditor will be picked up soon. Uh, we could wait and see the results of that audit and see if there's anything that needs to be addressed there before we make a final selection. That's y'all's call. There's nothing that says we have to vote at the next meeting or the meeting after just so we make a decision. Uh, both Darrell and Aaron are serving out terms that have expired back in March. Whoever we elect will finish out that four-year term, minus what's already been served. All right, so we're just going to appoint one? No, we're appointing two. There's two terms open. Yeah. But it will just be for the remainder of the term okay. since it expired back in March, if I understood James right. All right. All right. Yeah, Thank those you. Date, those, the March is the expiration date for both. Yeah, that's what I understood. March 15th is yeah. the expiration date for both. I just want to share with you. Thank you. Just Thank you. So, and gentlemen, real quickly, for the two of you that were hailing hardy and stayed with us, um, mosquitoes. Uh, that did not come up. Uh, the person that brought it to the table is not with us right now. Uh, you received what information I sent you, the links that Patricia was kind enough to provide. Uh, that got us over to the authoritative site. If you go to the CDC site, the CDC does not recommend spraying. They only recommend spraying in the case that you have a vector where there is a disease occurring, an outbreak, and only after you've done a study to indicate that there is a mosquito problem that's caused that. In the state of Alabama, everybody keeps bringing up Zika. In the past period, there have only been three cases identified. They were in South Alabama, and those three, the, the uh, jury is still out. Of uh, the cases identified nationwide of Zika, all but one have been identified or linked to foreign travel, not to acquisition. So from a Zika standpoint, there is not a threat from mosquitoes currently in the state of Alabama. If you look at West Nile virus, the same holds true. There were two cases in Jefferson County. There were scattered cases over the state that amounted to about 30. Again, the emphasis with the CDC is the individual needs to take precautions to protect themselves from mosquito bites. 
including right. approved repellents, making sure sources of water that breed larva are either treated or removed, and spraying does not kill larva. It only kills adult mosquitoes. And if you think about the process of spraying, it's sprayed to the front of the properties. It may drift to the back, it may not. What we use is a product that's commonly available over the counter because it doesn't require any special license. It's used to treat certain types of infections that are common among school children. And so it's out there, it's relatively safe according to the EPA, but again, it doesn't really do anything more that can be done by citizens being aware of what they do when they're outdoors, being careful when they are outdoors. And first thing the CDC recommends is you have a very thorough campaign of eliminating sources of larva. So that's emptying out water sources or treating them. The city cannot obtain the treatment discs from the health department, but they will gladly give them to any individual citizen free of charge. No, I haven't seen the first mosquito. Well, so we haven't had a problem, but there seems to be an indication that there is a tremendous mosquito problem. Uh, what we've seen pretty much in our area, Terry, and we back up the woods like you do, mm -hmm. has been gnats and other insects. Yeah. And the biggest problem is the people that are putting out the CDC indicated things that zap bugs, kill dragonflies, and other insects that kill mosquitoes. So, uh, you know, it's still a thing. We basically could make a recommendation to the mayor. I don't think it's anything we can impose because it is something that the, the city uh, streets and sanitation has to do. Well, the, well, the council has to fund it, so that... Uh, but but we'll again, we will probably get questions tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, the facts are there. Following the CDC recommendations, there is no reason to spray. And the only reason I included Homewoods, uh, thanks to my wife finding that particular policy, it clearly outlines why they do not spray in a very distinct manner and it is done in such a professional fashion that after reading it you would wonder why anybody would spray. Uh, I think uh, we got one copy of something from Wetumpka. When I call Wetumpka they currently are not spraying and I don't know why someone picked Wetumpka since it's not even close by, it's more down in the mosquito belt, if that makes sense. So. We'll see. That will probably be a discussion that will come up. Uh, I have not had but one call out of my district, uh, so it's not been an issue that I've been urgently having to request. I think Mr. Spivey addressed his own problem. <laughs> so, but I have again, a lot of people asking about yeah. it. Though. A lot of people are very, but, very curious about it. And I've had just as many people, you know, calling me and saying, "Don't spray." So, and uh, I don't, I don't want it around me because I don't want, I know what a pyrethrin is. I don't want to inhale it. I don't have it on me. I'm sorry if I don't have a reason. And again, there is not an infection going on that requires the mosquitoes be killed to prevent the spread of disease. Well, I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we'll address this um, again tonight, but going through that, I found it very beneficial. All of the things that have to be done in a certain way that actually makes it effective. You, you, you slightly screw this up and it's a complete waste of time. You know, whether the way the machine has to be calibrated as to what time the person drives the truck as far as to is it still is there a slight wind or is there a breeze um what is the humidity you know um, um where it rains within the next whether hours. it's going to rain there i mean there is a i don't even know if we're smart enough to figure out the best day to spray for maximum effectiveness well again uh you know i i just all i can say is if, right. any, if i'm one thing i do have infection control expertise for my years in healthcare. And I can tell you, we follow CDC guidelines when there's any doubt. And the CDC, by no means, under our current circumstances. Now, even the mayor said if there was an outbreak or some indication right. that something was going on, we'd be the first to be out there spraying like crazy and doing the other. But I, I think we've got to figure how we get the citizens involved to do an active campaign in, in neighborhoods to start getting out water sources and getting with the health department, which only they can do to get those free fungal. Do we do we know if the mosquito ordinance is being enforced? Have there been any citations? I'm sure that within ten, five to ten minutes of driving around the city, we could probably scratch down about five or ten, you know, mosquito breeding habitats. Um, so I mean, my question would be: Are we are we enforcing that? Because that would be huge. 
And if we're not enforcing it, then we're we'll just shooting ourselves in the foot. With, with all the rain we've had, I've got right. two items that I turn over at least every right. other day to get the water out of it. So and, I, and David, I think that would probably be a question for Frank. Sure. Uh, and again, I think that's one of the things when we talk about even our uh, increase in property taxes, at some point, if we want to start enforcing our ordinances to that degree, right. we're going to have to look at an enforcement officer. Okay. It's going to have to be somebody like a police officer yeah. where they've got power. Uh, because right now, we do it some with the building inspector when he's out. Right. We do it with some of the employees when they're out. We don't have a, a program to look at people that dump, that, you know, accumulate water, that type of thing. So, sure, sure. Um, and and that, those are those are good questions for Ken as far as how he manages his staff. Um, and the chief will join us tomorrow night right. should we come up with a question about the trolls and holiday gardens. Right. Uh, the question I was going to ask, I'm sorry you left early, was is that something that's basically seasonal when the kids are out of school? Uh, because the chief did not see any increase in crime reports or anything in the area. Gotcha. So suddenly we've got this urge to have more patrols. Uh, what's the reason for it? Because I don't necessarily want to pull off my neighborhood. Uh, no more than anybody else does, I would turn. Sure. Um, and my other thing would be I would like to, if I forget to ask you know, the question, is you know, the Public Works is saying they're dropping some sort of mos mosquito killing something into standing water. They're trying to. It's the same thing you get from the health department. Okay. So, there, so I guess the frequency, um, you know, um, are, there, are there trouble spots that we're consistently treating? You know, what's, what is, what is well, he using that for? Yeah, the treatment actually, I think uh, we put them in the fish pond and they lasted three months. Okay, so, so it's you not can deploy these things one time yeah, and pretty they're well good. covers it. It's a little floating uh, type thing. Okay. Stay, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt my fish. I know it doesn't hurt earth things. Fair enough. And uh, so it's it's one of those things that people just have to be aggressive about treating for it, wearing appropriate clothing when they're outdoors, and using repellent. Yeah. Fair enough. And that's CDC's top recommendation. And if you go to the EPA website, what does it say? Refer to the CDC. So. And Jefferson County uh, Health Department, as well as the State Health Department, follow CDC guidelines. And they would inform us, I think, like I said, two nine, West Nile and uh, Birmingham during the 12 month reporting period that I was able to find the uh, State Health Department. Cool. Yeah. We make a motion we adjourn. I second. Aye. Uh,